Patel. Big fan. Um, so my name is Fintan Ryan. I'm an industry analyst at Redmonk. We're a developer-focused industry analyst firm. And I'm delighted to be here today to be able to moderate this panel. And I would like the guys from Comcast to introduce themselves, please. So Uma, if you'd like to go first. Uh, sure. Uh, I'm Uma Tumala, working as a developer, uh, working on uh, transformation of our uh, legacy SVOA platform to cloud-native microservices at Comcast. And I'm Chris Tretina. I lead the technical architecture team for the department that I'm a part of at Comcast. Good afternoon. I'm Greg Otto, and I lead the cloud product engineering team for Comcast. Cool. So obviously, um, we've heard Comcast mentioned earlier on today. Abby was citing a couple of figures um, earlier. Um, for people that are here for the first time and may not be familiar with Comcast's journey with Cloud Foundry, could you tell us a little bit about the background and kind of the scale that you're at at this point? Yeah, and in the spirit of rapid change, I'm going to have to apologize to Abby because her slides from just a few moments ago are already out of date. So, <laughs> so we're, we have over 1,500 developers uh, on our platform. We have over 12,000 application instances. And then uh, we also have about 210 million transactions that we process every single day on the platform. So we gained about 30 million since, uh, since our keynote a few minutes ago. And then uh, last year when I was up, here, uh, we were in the tens of millions of transactions a day, so now we're in the hundreds of millions. So things change uh, pretty quickly. Cool. Yeah, we were, we were joking backstage that Abby should put the slides up in GitHub and we can just do pull requests to update the stats <laughs> as it's going through. Um, the, the kind of cultural shifts and cultural changes that happen in organizations when a technology like Cloud Foundry is rolled out are quite that can be quite profound. Could you tell us a little bit about kind of the organization, the way it was, and the silos that exist, and how you've kind of moved beyond that over the last couple of years? You mean when we were transforming our cultural <laughs> shift? <laughs> yes. <laughs> sure. So when we got started back in 2014, uh, we were facing a couple of key challenges that probably many companies are facing. Uh, the first was we did not have a way uh, to express with our business partners the impact of the incidents that were occurring. Additionally, we had very stark divisions. We were very siloed in our methodology between developers, operations folks, and testers. On top of that, we knew that we wanted to train up those engineers, but we didn't have a solid plan for doing so. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, we just weren't able to move at the pace that the business wanted to in terms of taking some great new idea and deploying it up through to production. So when we, when we began our transformation, we put in a couple of key changes. Uh, the first was we agreed with our business partners on some common language. We called it impact duration uh, for how we wanted to communicate the customer felt impact whenever one of our applications had an incident. Uh, as Greg knows, this was key for us in terms of putting together a business case that we could put in front of our executives to get the initial funding that we needed to really kickstart our journey. The second piece is that we did some organizational realignments uh, to put developers and operations folks together to form DevOps teams, and then added testers like Uma herself here, that's her background, testing and development, together to form value teams. Uh, teams that can deliver complete end-to-end -end business value all within the context of one two pizza box size team. And then we brought in Pivotal and Accenture to help really jumpstart us. You know, we thought we were doing Agile and DevOps the best that we could, uh, but once we brought those guys in, you, you haven't seen anything until you've seen them do pure Agile. And that's what really then led us to be able to do the DevOps culture shift that started to enable the increase to cycle time. Um, just on that, that kind of training aspect and uh, the kind of retraining and reskilling people, could you talk a little bit about kind of how that has changed over time? Like at the moment, they, there's a, literally a tsunami of technologies coming at people and we can't just take people out for training courses for two weeks and put them back in as much as sometimes a training course is a nice thing to get away to. So kind of like the, the on the job type training, can you talk a little bit to us about that? Sure. Uh, funny enough, in a, in a past life, uh, we went through a, a similar transformation at a different company, uh, and it was very classroom-based, uh, which certainly has its place, but uh, we weren't able to come up with the kind of iterative value that we wanted. 
Uh, so knowing that, uh, when we brought in Pivotal and Accenture to help us, uh, we were very keen on, we want it to be on the job training. We want our folks, our, our teams on the ground to pair with those guys on delivering real business value for actual applications that we were looking to build anew or to migrate. Um, and, and it was hugely successful. We were able to, to get some of those folks, uh, many folks now, I think we have, I don't know, 50 some odd teams probably uh, on the platform uh, using the existing knowledge that they had before. Cool. Um, when you started out on this, this whole journey, um, like kind of the, the standard method that a lot of people use is they play it safe and they choose something small. It's not something you guys did. Can you tell us a little bit about the kind of applications that you chose to start with? Yeah, yeah, this was, uh, this was one we, we really hit out of the park, I think. Um, when we first started looking at what we wanted to tackle, uh, the first temptation was to choose something very small, uh, very easy, uh, to try and get a big, quick win. Um, but then we did a lot of analysis between Greg and Uma, and then certainly shot out to, to Todd and Rob over there and their teams uh, for looking at what were the highest value applications that we could move and value in terms of traffic and number of incidents that we could avoid. Uh, so we, we chose three pretty good sized services, you know, three out of a hundred some, uh, but by migrating those, we were able to move 40% of the traffic off of the platform by the end of year one and free up enough capacity where the following year we could do the remaining 60 some odd services. Cool. So all of this then ultimately ties back to developers and developer productivity so Uma, could you tell us a little bit about kind of the developer journey and where you guys have got to at this point and how you, how you feel it's all got, it's moved? Oh, sure. Um, so this was definitely a big challenge until 2015 uh, because we had a solid line in between the developer, a tester, and the operations. But we adopted at Comcast a couple of the things to really shift to a DevOps mindset. Uh, one of the things we did is uh, we introduced the new tools, technologies such as continuous integration, continuous development, and also we did the test-driven development. We shift the te testing to far left and then start writing many, many tests early in the cycle because we were on the, this big monolithic platform, Heavyweight, which used it to take 250 million plus transactions on any given day. To scale that kind of application on a uh, monolithic platform, it used to take months for us because um, when developer write the code for us to deploy that code to uh, different environments, testers use it to open the ticket, put it in the queue, operations use it to take the ticket, takes a couple of hours to deploy, testers find the defects, the process goes and goes. So there were a lot of manual steps in there but with the continuous integration and continuous uh, development and also with test-driven development, we were able to achieve. Uh, I can give you one real-time example. Uh, at Comcast, um, delivering the new products and services to customer houses is our job. We, we try to uh, deploy new devices to customer accounts. Uh, on, on that old platform, like enterprise services platform, which is a legacy, it used to take three to four months for us to deploy any new feature to production. But with the continuous integration, with the, with the collaboration from the teams, we, used it to de we, we started deploying any new feature to the production in 15 days, even less than 15 days. So that is a major culture shift that Chris was talking about. And also, we removed a lot of manual steps in our processes. So that, that was a major shift in the DevOps methodology. Cool. Would you be able to touch just a little bit more on the, the TDD part of it and how you feel that that has changed the way people are approaching development? Yeah, sure. So we had to have a common release schedule. Um, we have like 20 plus development teams. Um, we use it to share common release schedule. So everybody put in the code on the same day um, by operations, but we were not talking to each other. We were not collaborating. Every team is in their own silos, their own issues. But once we started going into the DevOps, um, we were deploying all the applications into production at our own pace, but still we were collaborating. We started collaborating 
We had a private uh, Slack channels with like 400 plus developers talking every day, talking about the issues, solutions, different innovations. So th that really changed the culture shift in Comcast. Cool. You, just um, in, in terms of like this, this, the emergence of Slack channels, that this is something, I was talking with the guys backstage about this, that it's something that's coming up as an emerging theme in lots of organizations we talk about where there are whole diverse communities of people who haven't spoken to each other before now, now talking. Could you talk a bit about kind of the cross-pollination of ideas and like what you're seeing in terms of that? I, yeah, I can take that. So. When we started to roll out Cloud Foundry, we created a Slack channel. We used Slack for real-time communications and collaboration. And you know, it was a really easy way for us to be able to share what was going on. And this, this kind of community phenomenon was, was happening uh, naturally, which was really interesting. So we have over 750 people. Uh, actually, I think it's closer to 800 people, so even I'm out of date. But <laughs> Uh, and, and what was really interesting is that development teams that normally would never even talk to each other, totally different products, are all collaborating on a real-time basis, sharing best practices, helping each other out. And it really started to see a, a shift in the way in which you know, all the developers were collaborating across these diverse teams. And then I think Chris and Uma can talk a little bit more about you know, how that inspired them to, to create product channels for their own development organizations. Yeah, like the XSP channel, right, Uma? Yes. Um, so we rebranded our enterprise services platform, ESP, to Xfinity service platform. That is our Comcast brand. So we introduced our own Slack private channel um, with the name same XSP, where like 400 developers, even though they were all looking for solutions from the architecture core, architecture team, if some other team already had that issue and they resolved it, they, they used it to pitch in. They started pitching in, they started providing the solutions and pair programming. If already a team experienced the issue and provide, found the, the solution, we used it to pair them with the right folks. That's where we started collaborating. And one of the other things that we were doing is, anytime we are introducing the new frameworks, new libraries, or any upgrades, we started communicating using our development forum. Um, so we used it to take the constructive feedback, we keep on making the changes. So there was a lot of improvement from the initiation of the framework to where we are right now. Cool. So kind of the, the feedback loops have got shorter in terms of all the, all the conversations? Well, feedback was always welcoming, um, which really helped us to improve more and more on making the things very easy for all the development teams across the board. Yeah, I think you referred to it earlier, Uma, as community-driven problem-solving and innovation. Yes, true. Which is, it's a really, really nice kind of evolution from, from where things were. Um, one of the other aspects that, that has struck me, um, I've, I've heard Greg talk before during um, an analyst session here last year, um, the growth in terms of developer adoption within Comcast and kind of like from a a relatively low base to the point you're at now. Could you just tell people just a little bit about what, the, what that kind of growth rate has been? Uh, sure, and we'll definitely ask Chris and Uma to jump in, but the, the growth in the developers, I mean, we started with you know, very small teams, and my team is not marketing this to uh, the rest of the developer community, but you know, once we had some of the wins that Chris described and his first services that we moved over, and some of the developers were feeling that lift of anywhere from 50 to 75% improvement in productivity. So spending more time on code and, and delivering new product experiences for our customers, it really started to expand because of all the, all the developers talking to each other and you know, encouraging them to, you know, to try it out. So it really just it's kind of exploded from there. Yeah, I think our development community really craved the independence uh, any initial hesitation, I think, was washed away once the first couple of teams migrated uh, and started seeing the advantages that, that Uma described earlier around no ticketing to, to do deployments, uh, the ability to de deploy on hours uh, without a CM, things like that, a change management ticket. Um, those things really encouraged the teams that moving to this platform was a reward and something that they wanted to do in order to provide more business value quicker. Which is a, a nice bridge to my next question, which is about the, the business value. So like essentially, like 
technology is ultimately about customer experience. And you're not, in a large enterprise, you're not going to get investment in, in technology unless you're changing the customer experience. So could you talk to us a little bit about the business value aspects of what, what you've seen over the last number of years? Yeah, so I, I, I can take that and then uh, hand it over to Chris. So again, when we had some of the resiliency challenges with our applications that were impacting the business and our customers, that was really kind of the first challenge. So we think about the business value across three dimensions. One was the resiliency of the applications that moved onto the platform. The other one is around time to market and improved productivity. And then the third being scale. So scale is, is hugely important for us. And you know, just some of the numbers in uh, the impact minutes that we've had, uh, we actually decreased those 81%. And then at the same time, the amount of time that it took for the teams to resolve issues when they did come up was in increased by twice. So they were able to solve problems twice as fast. And then in terms of the frequency, it was happening half as much. So all of those things conspired to create a really awesome story around the resiliency of our applications and then the, you know, the improved customer experience and, you know, for the business that resulted. And then from a time to market, across the entire platform, it, we're seeing at least 50% improvement in, in time to market. Um, and you know, some of the teams, it, it's, even, it's even higher than that. Um, and then I don't know, Chris, if you want to talk about some of the specific examples from your group. Yeah, I mean, first of all, it's, it's funny thinking back to the end of 2014 when, when we were sitting together, Greg, talking about that that number, because at the time we got the funding, having promised that by the end of 2016, uh, we'd reduce by 40% impact duration, not knowing at the time how we were going to do that. Yeah. Uh, and here we are today sitting before you having reduced by over 80% in just about the same time period, much of which has to do with our migration to Cloud Foundry uh, and the additional resiliency that provided. Um, one of the great examples uh, that I love telling this story um, near the end of 2015, uh, Greg and I and a couple of other folks sitting over yonder uh, were getting ready to present to our CEO the next day on, hey, here's what we built, isn't it great? Uh, the night before, uh, we found a bug in one of the services that we had migrated. Um, and we ended up fixing that bug and deploying all the way through to production with complete automated testing in a few hours that night. So it was pretty fortuitous going into the next morning to be able to have that story and say, this is exactly the kind of value now that we're able to deliver. Uh, a fix that probably would have taken us at least a week with our, own, with our old cycle now took us just a couple of hours, and that was so impactful. Yeah, it really demonstrated the power of the platform and, and you know, allowed us to kind of put it through its paces and uh, Definitely a, a fortunate moment that you know <laughs> demos can go bad, especially in front of your executives. Um, there was also another you know pretty cool uh, moment that happened, and and it was last year when Chris and I were heading out to the Spring One platform conference, and uh, he had talked about it on stage when I, I didn't even know, <laughs> but uh, literally the night before we were all flying out. Uh, the couple of the folks uh, from the team were a little groggy, and that's because it was an issue the night before. And again, they were able to uh, create a patch and then run it through you know, the, all the cycles, uh, fully automated, and in the, the production environment, which is you know, pretty sizable. And it was you know, like two to three hours, which was pretty incredible. Yeah, it was really nice last year to be able to share that on stage. I mean, it literally had just happened as I was, as I was walking up to present. Uh, and it was just a great better together story, as you like to say, Greg, between uh, the two teams, the, the team running Cloud Foundry under, under Greg, and then all the application teams like myself, like Uma's, uh, throughout the organization partnering together uh, to solve a problem literally in less than 24 hours after we found it and live on ours. Yeah, I was a little nervous when he started to tell the story because I was like, uh-oh, you know. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I was going to steal it. <laughs> well, I wasn't sure if it, if it turned out well because it was news to me at the time. So it was, yeah, it was pretty cool. So I guess one other, one other business value or business metric that's, that's of interest, I think, to most people in this audience is developer productivity and just 
getting things done faster. Um, I, don't, I don't have quite as cool a phrase as what Bjorn had from SAP. Um, could you talk to us just a little bit about like kind of the, the speed gains that you've seen in terms of like bringing kind of products out and, and the iterations yeah. on them? Well, one of the thing um, we had the challenge is scaling the applications um, because with 250 plus million transactions on any given day, any issue that comes up in production and deploying the patch to the production for all, all different farms in the production, it was a quite challenge for operations team monitoring perspective. But now we were able to deploy it in production across all the application instances and our strong monitoring was helping us to see how health is looking like. So that, that was the biggest shift as well, where we were able to see the issues before even our consumers, our, cost, our customers are actually identifying. So that, that, was, that was another interesting thing that, that really helped us as well. Cool, cool. So for, for those of you that have never kind of sat up on a stage like this, we've got a timer that's timing down in front of us. And if you've looked at the schedule, we apparently have 40 minutes. Um, but I'd never like it to be said that a red milk analyst stopped people getting to beer. So we kind of have to, <laughs> we have, have to move things on a little bit. So you'll be pleased to know this is actually my last question. But before I ask my last question, if you're interested in hearing a little bit more about this, Greg is giving a talk tomorrow at um, 3.45, yep, I believe 345. it is. So, pop along to, that, to that, um, that talk. So the last question, two words, what's next? Yeah, I mean, we've come a long way in a short period of time. Uh, we're pretty happy with where we're at, but we're striving for more. Uh, the next big two items are using Cloud Foundry as an enabler for multi-cloud. Uh, we have a desire to run both in private cloud as well as multiple different uh, public cloud providers. Uh, and we think the abstraction that Cloud Foundry provides us gives us the ability to do that. And then the second big item is around digital first. Uh, that's where we really want to be able to give our customers the ability to interact with us on their smartphones, on Xfinity.com as the first line of defense. Um, Greg and I were talking just before, and I believe the last time I saw, we take uh, 300 million phone calls per year. That's a lot of customer interactions from folks who I'm sure would prefer to interact with us through digital means uh, versus waiting on the phone for a little while. So you've probably seen some of the press releases. We're making great progress already, uh, but we're looking to get there and really transform the customer experience. Yep. Cool. Well, thank you very much, folks. All right. Thanks. Thanks.